Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to part four of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way. We're getting into some valuable insights from this week's guests that you can definitely apply to your own journey. Please definitely stay tuned for advice and inspiration that can help us all. If you missed the first part of the week in part one, two, and three, definitely go back. The show notes should be filled with all the links, so go and click on them if you need to catch up. Also, definitely subscribe to the channel and all the other ones if you can. It's going to really help the show. But for now, enjoy the rest of the story. He had a heart attack in my mum's bedroom. My mum was actually getting ready for work and she heard a big thud, went into the bedroom. He was on the floor and um, stopped breathing. She thought he was messing around. She rang his friend and um, he said, bring the ambulance because it's the sort of thing he would do. It was the biggest joker in the world. So she rang the ambulance. The ambulance came. He'd gone. Um, She never recovered from that. She was a mess. Um, we did, it was just horrendous. It was the biggest shock ever anyway. So, um, she did take an overdose then after his funeral, she took an overdose, didn't think she could ever live without him. And, um, so she ended up in, um, Crispin's hospital, which I've since found is still there, but it's called something else, which is a mental institution. I remember when she divorced from my dad. So there, I've ne- not mentioned there was a, before this, there was a guy, Greg was a guy, he's still around Greg and he actually adopted me. So from, I think he got with my mum when I was six, married her when I was nine. And then they divorced not long after that. They were very young. And um, so he adopted me. And I think he did want me to think that he was my real dad. But again, my mum was very honest and sort of always made me known that he wasn't my real dad. Um, And um, anyway, he now lives in Portugal. I'm going out to visit him soon. And um, that's all good. And then she met Jack. And then unfortunately he died. So um, so that was really sad. So she ended up in, she took an overdose, ended up in um, Crispin's hospital. And oh, I didn't say when she split up with Greg, she took an overdose then. I think she took an overdose when they were together. So there was many a times that I so remember, that? I remember once going to hospital, visiting her and sort of telling her off, you know, and... Um, and then she'd sort of get together again. It's weird. She always worked full time and she'd, but the minute, and her, I think her antidepressant was alcohol. She'd have a drink in the evening uh, and a few maybe, Bacardi and Coke and um, and a cider now and again. Anyway, oh, where am I going with this? Yeah, so um, so it was, a, it was a thing, you know, like she couldn't cope um, anymore. She would take, um, she would get prescribed antidepressants, but she'd take them for a week and feel all right or two weeks. She hated taking medication hated it so um she would take them for a week or two feel better and then um and then obviously didn't feel better and and then take an overdose so um so yeah jag died how many overdoses do you think she had so there was when she was pregnant with me um Mm. i'm not sure about um before her meeting greg um so um but i know there was one when they were together i think they'd split up and she couldn't cope and um yeah she just couldn't be on her own she just i think she found it really hard to cope being on her own she kind of needed to have that partner and um so um and then so i think she took one then and then they got back together so that was like a cry for help i guess and then um and then they split up and um yeah she was she was in a pretty bad way then and um and I think then she ended up in Crispin's and then got herself together, come back out and then uh, met Jag and that was amazing and then he died. So she's like fucking all the luck in the world, you know, and so um mm. she took an overdose. She ended up in Crispin's and she met this guy in Crispin's who was an absolute loser, waste of space. His name was Steve Owen and he, he had his arms were all absolutely slit to bits and his claim was that he was in the Falklands war and he got shrapnel in his arms well we soon found out it wasn't shrapnel he was a he liked to slit his wrists and they got into a relationship together they discharged himself um from uh Crispin's hospital and decided to travel the world <laughs> well not the world but a little bit of Europe anyway England and and um mm. now at this point I was 14 15 my sister lived two doors up this all sounds very incestual and weird but it wasn't she lived two doors up from me with her nan So going back, she lived two doors up from me with her nan. Her nan died, then my nan died, and then her mum moved into the house. Gets very confusing. Um, Her mum and her dad, which is Jack, who was with my mum, they'd been divorced eight years. They were well, you know, well out of the picture with each other. But her mum moved next door with her partner, Trev, with Jodie. So Jodie, my sister, was living two doors up from me, and uh, she's two years older than me. And, um, yeah, so we were still, we were very, very close. Exhausting, isn't it? Where was I going (laughs) 
<laughs> so anyway, that you, was it. Yeah, my mum. You were traveling. Yeah, my mum discharged herself and I was actually living on my own in the house. This is all really weird because it's all a bit of a blur. My sister could tell the story better, but I think I was meant to be living with Jodie two two doors up and with her mum and her mum's partner, which I was. But then sometimes we would go to my house two doors down and just stay there on our own. We could have the house to ourselves, even though my mum at the time was in hospital. Um, My family, my granddad and everyone felt that I was being cared for by Jodie's mum. And um, which I kind of was, I suppose. And um, and yeah, my mum decided to discharge herself with this idiot Steve and travel for a bit. And um, she had money in the bank, but then that money soon ran out. And then we were getting letters in the post where she was where checks were being bounced. And there was one with an airport in Ireland. We're like, fuck's sake, you know, there's no mobile phones then or anything. You know, she'd probably use a, a thingy phone. To, she did sometimes to ring up say she's okay. And I was like, Mum, just come home. It's fine. She's like, no, I've got myself in Paris to come home. Um, you know, and she's with this guy traveling around. Um, any, I can't remember the timelines, but months later, she eventually did come home. And um, and I, she come home to sort of decide that she's going to settle everything, um, not sell the house. It was a council house or anything, but she was going to move away again and move to Wales, which is where this idiot that she was still with, his family were from. So I said, well, you're not going without me. I'm coming with you. I think I'd just finished school mm-hmm. um, or that year. It's like the summer holidays of school. And um, so I went with them and travelled down to Wales. And, oh, my God, this is a part of my life that I like to just sort of forget about because it's quite embarrassing, really. Well, not embarrassing, but... I went with them to Wales. I think it was over a period of a month. And um, and they were full on alcoholics at this point, my mum and Steve. And um, so, God, actually, it's quite, yeah, it's quite bad. Um, we got into a bed and breakfast in Wales, in Porth Call in Wales. And um, I just remember bits of it, really. I remember once us being on a beach and then drinking cider, and I'm sat with them as a 15-year-old. And I think sometimes I had a bit of cider. God, it's so bad. This is probably a part of my life that I'd rather just forget. Um, And they would argue, and then she was never happy with being with him, but she felt she had to stay with him. So he would say things to her like, if you leave me, I will kill myself, and then that's two men that you've killed, because she always blamed herself for Jack dying because he died on her bedroom floor and she didn't ring the ambulance straight away. So she always blamed herself for that. So he said, if you leave me, I'm going to kill myself. And that's what he'd do. If she said, right, we're finished, he would then start slashing his wrists. I remember one time I'm cleaning up his wrists. Like It's a bit of a messed up period. But um, yeah, and I was actually seeing someone at the time um, in um, who was in Northampton. And I think he'd come out and picked me up and because I said, I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. I was trying to I was trying to get my mum to split up with him and I was going to be with her when it happened. You know, I was sort of looking after her, but it just wasn't happening. And um, I didn't want to leave her on her own with him, but she, I realised she just kept going back with him and, I, and there was only so much I could do. So um, eventually I left. I can't remember the time period, but I left and I come back to Northampton. And um, that was then when I got into the private college for my last year. Sheila took me under her, under her wing and I went to Bosworth Tutorial College and uh, my mum stayed. My mum still carried on traveling about with this idiot and drinking. And then, um, yeah, so that that happened. And um, and then, yeah, I went to college for a year and that was pretty that was pretty good. Actually, I had a good year. I studied a lot and did probably a lot better than I would have done if I'd have stayed in high school, normal high school. And, um, yeah, I lived at Sheila's. She was amazing. And her son lived there and his best mate, Damien. So they were like my foster brothers. She fostered me. So I was their foster family, which was lovely. And, um, yeah, and my mum would ring every now and again. And, you know, I'd always worry about her. But I realised I couldn't, you know, I had to do what I needed to do for my um, exams and stuff for school. Um, yeah, what was the question? <laughs> I'm going with this. Your mum committing suicide. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I finished, I finished, um, yeah, sorry, I finished, did you want to talk, sorry. No, no, so were you living, were you out of the house, so were you living with your mum around that time that she died, she passed, yes. or were you, so, uh, yeah, were sorry. you back so living I did, my year at, I did my year at Bosworth, I got my GCSEs, when I finished, when I finished that year, my mum was then living in Weymouth, and I said, stay there, because I really like Weymouth, so I went to visit her, 
And um, I went on a coach, National Express or whatever it was there, and I remember getting off at the coach and seeing my mum. Now, my mum always took pride in the way she looked. She always looked beautiful. She was a bit of a Lady Diana, always looked like Lady Diana and went with the fashions at how she looked. And I got off the coach and my mum had put on twice the amount of weight. She never put on weight. And um, she was still with him, who was an absolute wanker, an idiot. And, um, yes, yeah, so they met up with me and then we went back to the flat where they were staying and um and then she proceeded to tell me that she was pregnant and um, I was like oh my god are you joking this cannot happen and at that point she knew she was at a state where she couldn't be drinking she was drinking which is why she put on a lot of weight she had a counsellor who I met Julie and then Julie said she can't have this baby because and then showed us pictures of what a baby would look like um through the effects of alcohol so I said to her you can't have this baby mum you can't and she kind of secretly behind his back she'd be like oh no I can't I've got to leave him I've got to leave him please help me she was he was absolutely had her wrapped round you know his finger and um she was just a mess so I, so I remember I was only there for a week I went back to Northampton and I said to Sheila I have to move down there I have to move and be with mum and Sheila was amazing she was really supportive she took me down there and um we went through the process I went with my mum to the hospital in Doncaster to have an abortion I remember it was awful she went in I walked around Doncaster for hours I remember crying thinking please survive this operation because it was she was quite far gone so she had the baby removed anyway that all went okay how, how far Again, hey how far um, I don't, I can't remember. It's all a bit of a blur. I know she'd gone past the three months, um, the three month stage. It wasn't good, but we said to her, you cannot have this baby. It's not fair on the baby. It's not fair. And I know I'm sorry for people and I understand people are against abortions and things like that, but that's what we had to deal with at the time. We looked at all avenues and this was the best thing, you know, that we could come to terms with. So, um, so yeah, that happened. And, um, so I was 16, I think, at that time. She'd lost, you know, we, we uh, aborted that baby. And um, and then we said, that's it now. I'm moving here with you. I remember Sheila gave us the deposit for a flat. We had a beautiful flat right on the um, tram line of um, in Weymouth. Weymouth is a beautiful seaside town. We loved it there. So me and her got this flat together, set up well together. I got a job at a... Um, I was going to be a nursery nurse looking after children, but it's good at that point. I actually don't think I, I enjoy children, so it's probably a good move anyway. I was meant to go to college in Northampton and didn't. I moved down to Weymouth to be with my mum and help her. And um, so, yeah, I got a job at a bakery full time. Shelley's Bakery doesn't even exist anymore, but in Weymouth and met lots of friends, met lots of new people. We put ourselves out there. We did women's self-defense and put ourselves out there, you know, meeting new people and all that and built up quite a nice life. Um, and that was in like the summer. Come Christmas, I remember I come home from work one day and mum just wasn't there. This is pre-mobile phones. I was like, where the hell is she? And I just had this bad feeling in my tummy. And I um, went looking for her and I went to, we had a local pub called The Dog House. And I went into that pub. Now, by this point, Steve was off the scene. We got rid of him. I think we got him arrested because he would just act ridiculous. He loved my mum and was obsessed with her. And we said, no, they're not meant to be together. They split up eventually. And we put an injunction out on him. So they could not, he could not be near her. And, um, and anyway, I remember this one night I come home. It was just before Christmas. In fact, no, it wasn't. It was just after Christmas. It was in between Christmas and New Year. I come home and mum was nowhere to be seen. So I went to this pub. I walked in there and lo and behold, there was my mum sat having a drink with him. Um, she hadn't drunk for months. We got her completely sober and there they were together. Now, this is a bit tender because this is something I'm going to say that not many people know. I don't think my granddad knows, but I don't think he's not going to listen to this. But, um, but yeah, I... Um, that was a real shock for me. And, um, and I thought everything that I've done, everything that I've worked for, you know, I've brought myself down here, left all my friends, left my life in Northampton. Not that I was ever fully happy in Northampton. I always felt that there was more to Northampton, but, um, you know, I'd done this and then she's just thrown that all back in my face. So I went high. I think I threw a pint in his face. Threw his, he was like, oh, hey, Sarah. He was Welsh. All right, Sarah. How's it going? I'm sorry, God, what you fucking fucker. And I remember throwing a pint in his face. I think ideally I wanted to smash it over his head, but I didn't. And I, um, and I went home. And my mum at the time was on these tablets. I think they're called Librium. How weird is that? It's come to my head. But there were these mini pills that were like a substitute to alcohol. 
And for some stupid reason, I just got the whole bottle and I've never done anything like this, never felt suicidal, never anything in my life. But at that, it just felt like a, it was definitely an F you to my mum. And I just swallowed the whole bottle of tablets. And I remember laying on the sofa, looking at our flashing Christmas tree and um, thinking, well, this is it. This is it. I'm done. And um, and I remember falling to sleep and suddenly thinking, fuck, my pap. Oh, my God. You know, and, and feeling devastated for him if he finds out that his granddaughter, because me and my pap were so close. Um, and then him thinking, oh, my God, I've committed suicide. You know, anyway, I just went off to sleep. And, um, and then I woke up in hospital and um, my mum had obviously come home found me asleep on the sofa, wasn't waking up, so she called an amb ambulance. And um, when I come round in hospital, um, the doctor gave me a telling off or had a chat, you know, and said that was a bit silly, you know, and they couldn't pump my stomach because that was already in my system or something. And, um, yeah, anyway, I mean, the, the fun side of that is I was very, very drunk for the next few days because <laughs> I took substitute alcohol tablets but um sounds awful but it um you know it wasn't it, I don't, it was a really stupid thing and this is when i this is why i'm so passionate about mental health because i know you can be up there one minute and down there the next and you can do the most stupidest thing um which only feels like the only way out at the time you know i know i understood then that it felt like the only way away from this noise and whatever i was feeling and um and yeah so um yeah, and it was, I mean, it was a wake-up call for my mum, and she certainly, unless she did it very secretly, but she certainly never saw him again after that, and, um, you know, and and then we spent the next two years quite happily in, in Weymouth, and I say that, but then she did, like I said, she kind of need, always needed to be with someone, so I'd say she was about single for about a year, or maybe six months, I can't remember, not good on timelines, but then she met this guy, Gary. We then moved to a bigger house. We got a nice two up, two down house down the road from where we were. And she was then working full time. She got herself back to normal again, was brilliant. She was, I was very embarrassed for what I did. Very embarrassed, not, you know, proud at all of that. But, um, you know, it's what happened, move on. And um, my mum then got a full time job at an old people's home working there. I used to sometimes help out doing nights there. But then I got a job working at Pontins in Weymouth and, um, I was the restaurant supervisor there. I was there for two years, one of the longest standing members of staff at Pontins. People don't go there long. They normally go there for holiday season and then piss off again. But I was there for two years, loved it, loved my job, loved working with people. I had so much fun and I had so much of a laugh with all my guests that I work with and, and all that. Anyway, get to the point. She met this guy, Gary. He was on a fishing trip in um, in Weymouth and was out one night. Mum met him and she really liked him. And I was like, oh, this seems nice. He seems quite a normal guy and really nice. And they, they kept seeing each other. He'd come down to visit. It was from Swindon. He'd come down to visit and spend the weekend. And eventually they got together. They got together. I can't remember how long it was, but she then fell pregnant. And... Um, and it wasn't such a bad thing. It was a bit of a shock. I was like nearly 18 at this point and um, was like, bloody hell, you know, she's um, pregnant. And um, was I? No, I was nearly 19. Sorry, I was 18. I was nearly 19. And um, so, but we thought, oh, that's fine. You know, we'll go with it. And um, yeah, um, as we we're getting nearer to the um, to the the due. So the baby was actually due on my birthday, the 28th of June. And um, and as we we're getting nearer to that in May, she started feeling really shit and um, couldn't explain it. She was working full time at the uh, old people's home and then she'd help out at the NSPCC, which is a child protection um, uh, charity that she helped out with. So she worked a lot and um, then um, she, um, yeah, she suddenly had this breakdown. She said, I come home once one day and she said, I don't know what's wrong with me. She was like this shaking. I don't know what's wrong with me. I've got everything I could ever want, but I just feel um, so depressed and and that um, I just need help. So I got the doctor out and he said, you're suffering from panic attacks. You need to stop working. I'm signing you off for two weeks. Stop working, rest, you know, you're overworked. And so she was like, okay. And it's not like her. She always has to have things to do and, Anyway, signed her off and um, and then I said, right, I'll take you out for the day. I was really worried about her because I haven't seen her like this for a long, long time. 
And um, I remember taking her out for the day to Monkey World to try and cheer her up. But it was just, she was trying to be happy for the sake of me, but I could see she just wasn't happy, you know. And um, and we would always joke about um, the fact that um, we didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. And she went, oh, God help it being a girl. You know, we always joked about that. I think I wasn't the best of teenagers. And um, and anyway, it was um, it was fine. So we had a name for a girl, Kaylee, and a name for a boy, Kieran. And and it was all fine. But, yeah, she just got really low. For some reason, she got really low. And she wouldn't take medication, obviously, because she was pregnant. Um, and then suddenly I, um, one morning, Gary took some time off to spend with her while she had these two weeks signed off, but then he had to go to work. And I remember he was working at a naval base and Prince Andrew used to go there and we thought, oh, it's amazing because you know, Prince Andrew, probably not something to be so proud of now, but <laughs> she, we're like, oh, it's so fun. You know, this is at Portland Beale in Weymouth. And, um, anyway, there was one day he said, I was back, I was living on Pontin, so I was living on camp in camp life. Um, and, um, he said, Sarah, I'm going to have to go into work tomorrow. You know, if you can come in and see your mum, that would be great. Um, don't stress about it though. She'll probably just spend the day in bed. And I said, no, it's fine. I'll come in and see her in the morning. I'll take the day off. And then lo and behold, because I was a supervisor, if anyone took a sickie, then I couldn't, I had to take their spot. And that morning, this one girl who was always sick, she took a sickie. So I thought, I'll do her shift and then I'll go in. And um, and I did her shift. I said to Gary, oh, I'm not going to be able to come in that, uh, that early, but I'll come in at lunch. She's like, it's fine. She'll probably still be in bed. It was a really hot day, the 28th of May, 28 years ago. And um, I um, got to my car, drove in the car, and the bloody exhaust fell off my car. And I was like, for God's sake, it had been blowing. I'd left it for a while. And so I just got the bus. So I waited another hour for the bus to take me in. I got the keys to the house. We got two dogs, Max and Lucky. And always, as soon as I walked in the door, the dogs would just dive on me. It would be quite annoying sometimes. I'd just roll around with them and play with them, you know, and it was weird. I, I went in the house and they didn't. They were nowhere to be seen. And I walked through the house. It was a beautiful sunny day. I walked through the house, walked into the garden, and um, and she wasn't there because I thought she'll be having a cup of tea in the garden. It's lovely weather. She wasn't. And then I went upstairs and the dogs were at the top of the stairs. So I'll give them a bit of love. And I went to the bedroom and she pulled the covers over. There was no one in the bed. She pulled the covers over. Now, she was such a clean freak and such, I realise I get that from her, a bit of OCD, just messy stress. And um, she she normally, if she got out of bed, she put the bed back, you know, but she didn't. And then I was like, where the hell is she? So I went back downstairs. I thought we'd had a bit of a curvy garden. I thought maybe she's in a bit, another bit of the garden. So I went downstairs again, shouting her and shouting her. Went back upstairs. Of course, the dogs the whole time were just sat at the top of the stairs. Now, behind, to the side of them was my old bedroom. To the back of them was the bathroom. I went to the bathroom and um, there she was, laying down on her front on the floor. So I was screamed, I think, and picked her up. And as I did, she groaned and that where her face was, I think she'd hit, we'd got like a little ledge in the bathroom where her face, her face had hit the ledge, there was blood. And at that point in my life at 19 or nearly 19, I hated the sight of blood, hated it. So I was just like, oh my God. And I ran back downstairs, I was freaking out and I rang, I rang 999 and the ambulance and I said it's my mum it's my mum I think she's collapsed and um, she's pregnant and they're like how far gone and then she was seven months pregnant and they're like okay we're coming out or nearly seven months pregnant and they said we're, we're coming out and um and um yeah so that was that and then I couldn't go back up there and it, I remember it being the blood I thought I can't I can't go back up so I ran outside ran down to the road our local pub was at the end of the road there's a theme here with pubs isn't there um that we knew the landlady uh Catherine I think her name was and um so I was banging on the window and she come out and I said it's my mum it's my mum she's um she's collapsed in the bathroom and we went back down and she went up and as she went up the ambulance come in and I heard her say oh my god and then come down and then the ambulance, they went up to my mum and um, and then they called to say, she got a doctor, can you get a doctor out? So I rang a doctor, a doctor came out and then he went upstairs. And now I remember there being a part of me, I remember actually now, I think about it more now, in the kitchen there was powder on the side in the kitchen and the... Um, we had a, a medical box, um, you know, I think people have them, you know, with all your pills and your inhalers and plasters and or band-aids for Australians. And, you know, you have everything in this box. And I think for my mum, she probably held a lot of um, 
maybe headache tablets, um, substitute for alcohol tablets, things that she'd probably stopped taking but still kept and put them in this box. And she'd often been prescribed um, uh, antidepressants, would take them for a week, felt better, would not stop taking them. So there were supplies of these all in this. It was a big box. It was like this of medication. This was out and I saw powder around the side. She hated swallowing tablets. So she would, like a child, would empty them or crush them. And um, anyway, and I saw that sort of evidence and I thought, I oh, know she's done it. I oh, know she's took tablets. But I, we've been here many times before. I can't remember how many times. And I thought, my God, I'm going to kill her. I can't believe it. I can't believe she, I'm going to kill her. God, I can't believe that she's done it, you know. And um, and then I thought, she, there's, she'll survive it. It'll be a cry for help, you know. And we'll be in hospital having a go at her and blah, blah, blah. And then um, anyway, the doctor had arrived. He'd gone upstairs to see her. And I remember then at the point I thought, I'm going to have a cigarette. So I did smoke. I was never proud of smoking always. And, and I hated it as well. It stunk. It was bad for your health. And I think I was on at the time roll-ups because it was cheaper and apparently better for you. But anyway, I started rolling up a cigarette. And then the doctor came downstairs and he walked up to me and I went to light it. And he went, I remember he said, no, go on, light it. You're going to need it. And I went, oh, God, what? And he went, I'm so sorry, your mum's sorry. He said, um. Stunning. I'm really sorry. Your mum's gone. And I went, oh God. And I went, oh God, no. And um and I think, you know, deep down I thought she wouldn't she wouldn't do it. She wouldn't do it fully. And um and then he said and then he said, and I'm really, really sorry, but also the baby's gone as well. And um, and I remember thinking at the time, this is really bad. I don't know why, but I do remember my thinking. And I want to be really honest about it. But I remember thinking, I don't give a shit about the baby. I don't know the baby. You know, I'm just fucking devastated that my mum's gone. And, um, yeah, sorry. So, um, just don't bother you. Um, yeah, so um, that was a bit of a shock. I thought, you bloody idiot, you've done it. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.